Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. This is Courtney Wilson with Fortify Insurance Group. Um, we are very excited to have Jamie Mueller, who is uh, our resident specialist with asset-based long-term care solutions um, as part of our uh, IMO AIN, Advanced Insurance Network. So we are very excited to have you. We're going to hop right in because we've got a lot to cover. Um, so please try to uh, use the dialog box. I believe it's up at the top of your screen that will allow you to post some questions. We'll certainly do our best to address those as we go. And if we find that we run out of time, which is very possible, um, I will note those and we'll follow up with you subsequent to the call. Uh, Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. Well, no, thank you so much. And I'm sorry, I just coughed in everybody's ear. So, like, full disclosure, I'm getting over a terrible cold. Um, but, yeah, we do have a lot to cover today. So, we're, we're going to move through this pretty quickly. Um, obviously, the goal that I'm trying to accomplish here is to show you multiple ways that we can leverage different types of assets to ultimately provide your clients with some, some great long-term care coverage. So, we're, we're going to start, though, with an overview of what asset-based long-term care is, or ADLTC. You'll see me use that acronym a lot. Um, just for those of you that are on the, the line that maybe aren't very familiar with this market segment, I think it's helpful to just kind of define that really quickly. And the easiest way for me to do that is to talk about long-term care on a spectrum. So on one far end of the spectrum, you've got your standalone long-term care insurance. Right, so these are those policies that obviously you're you're paying your premiums year after year after year. Um, there's no guarantee on those premiums; they can increase at any time. Um, obviously, we see that happen a lot. Now, when they do need the benefits, if they need the benefits, they're very robust policies, very effective for covering those expenses. Um, but obviously, we've seen a dramatic shrinkage in that market. Um, you know, carriers just exiting the space. Again, clients kind of becoming a little bit disillusioned, um, advisors becoming disillusioned because of the non-guarantees and, of course, that whole kind of use it or lose it type of situation of that product. Um, but I say all that, though, um, it is still an effective uh, policy. It, there's definitely a time and a place for that to be sold. On the other end of the spectrum is your long-term care riders that can be bolted onto or your chronic illness riders that are possibly embedded into a, a more death benefit focused product. Okay, so these are your, you know, your chronic illness on, uh, riders on your Symmetra policies or your long-term care riders on your John Hancock Protection UL, right? So when we're over on this end of the spectrum, our primary focus of the conversation is death benefit planning, right? It, it has to be. Um, that's how we're going to leverage most of our dollars. The fact that we can use all or a portion of that death benefit for care is what I call an ancillary perk, right? It, it's great backstop should you need it, but it's not the primary reason why we're looking at those life insurance products to begin with. Where asset-based long-term care fits in is kind of right in the middle. Okay, so when we're looking at asset-based long-term care, the primary focus of this conversation is long-term care. That's the reason we're talking. The fact that we're building that plan on an asset, which is most often a life insurance policy, sometimes it's an annuity, which we'll dig into, right, that, that's really only there, and we keep it minimum, um, really just high enough to answer the use it or lose it objection of standalone long-term care, right? But where for the premium dollar, uh, we still have an asset, though, on the books. With this market segment also comes a lot of guarantees that are very attractive to a lot of advisors and consumers. We've got a guaranteed premium that can never increase. We have guaranteed return of premium or cash surrender value, depending on the product that we go with. Obviously, we've got guaranteed long-term care, and these products are built on a simplified issue, accelerated underwriting type of platform. So this is just, again, a really high-level look as to what this market is and kind of how it fits into the planning spectrum. Now, within this market, we have several what I call, you know, kind of big hitters, okay? Um, there's obviously more than this, 
out there, but, but these are the ones that I see the most activity driving towards um, in my day to day. So you've got Lincoln Money Guard, um, what kind of, kind of call that, the grandpa of the market, like, like everybody's at least heard of them, if not written one or two. Uh, Nationwide has a product called Care Matters, and they just recently released Care Matters 2. You've got Securian's product out there called Secure Care. You've got One America with their Asset Care and the Annuity Care, and then you do have the Global Atlantic for Care. Now, you know, your, your Money Guard, you know, super strong, well-established company, great pricing, uh, reimbursement style contracts. You've got your nationwide and your Securian product, really similar in pricing to MoneyGuard, but they're going to offer a cash indemnity benefit. Uh, you know, kind of One America brings its own unique value to the table, um, and then Global Atlantic is an annuity-based option that we can work with. Now, I say all this to really drive to uh, when I'm talking to advisors day to day, they always ask me one question: Well, who's the best? And my short answer to that is it depends. And it depends on all of these factors, right? These are the questions that we kind of have to dig into to figure out which of those products value proposition is going to ultimately make the most sense for your client, right? Are we covering one or two people? Are they single or not? Do they use tobacco, right? That's a, that's a big one because they like money guard doesn't have a tobacco classification. So if you've got a tobacco user, that, you know, money guard might be where we need to look. Uh, you know, how old are they? How long do they want the benefits to last? How long do they want to pay? Um, are kind of your, your more common questions. And then, you know, we can kind of dig in deeper from there, even including, you know, are international benefits important to them, right? Some carriers are stronger than others. Uh, do they want to have the opportunity for some tax deductibility of a portion of these premiums or the opportunity to fund with an HSA? That helps us navigate which of those products, like I said, is going to make the most sense for your client. So that's a really, really long way to answer that question of who's the best. They're all the best in certain situations. Let me show you a quick little case study. And what I'm going to show you here is, is really about this entire spectrum, all the way from your standalone long-term care up to you know, your life insurance with writer and then asset-based long-term care. So let's say we have a female, she's 65 years old, okay? She's looking for about 10,000 a month of long-term care. Now she is married, so we're gonna use what we call a couple's discount on the asset-based products, but let's say husband's taken care of, maybe he's got something through his employer, so we're really just looking to put protection on her. So 10,000 a month of long-term care. I looked at Mutual of Omaha standalone long-term care. I looked at a John Hancock Protection UL with a long-term care writer, and I looked at two asset-based long-term care solutions. I looked at Care Matters 2 with Nationwide, and I looked at Asset Care with One America. But here's where I kind of want to point this, some things out here for you. Obviously, our standalone long-term care, which you'll find all the time, is going to have the most affordable entry premium. And I say entry because I'm going to build on that here in just a moment. So we're only going to have a premium of around $6,500 a year for her. Um, that's going to be four years worth of benefits. But notice, right, we have big zeros in the death benefit, cash surrender value. Right? We're not really building any sort of an asset for her for that premium. We're just putting about $480,000 total you know, pool of long-term care for her on the table. With the John Hancock Protection UL product, um, you know, a little bit more expensive by about what three grand or so a year, but we're going to drive a, a greater death benefit here, and that's what I mean by the leverage of dollars. So way more death benefit than any of the other options we'd have on the table, and we'd have a pool of about 50 months worth of long-term care at 10,000 a month. A little bit of cash value there. Um, that's obviously non-guaranteed in this particular product with a current assumption. And then we have our two asset-based long-term care products. Now, the, the premium, you know, definitely on the higher end of these. But here's what we're generating for her. Um, I went with the Nationwide Care Matters 2 product on this one because it actually priced out really well for her. Um, and it's actually one of the only products that we can use with a life pay type of premium structure. But I could get her up to $840,000 of total long-term care. 
I also have an option with Asset Care with One America to put a lifetime and limited benefit on the table for her. Maybe she's got concerns about Alzheimer's or dementia or something like that where she's more comfortable knowing that there's no end point. But what I also want you to pay attention to on this slide is the cash surrender value and the return of premium. Those are actually guaranteed value, right? They're, they're not projected, they're guaranteed. So as we're paying money in, we do have a death benefit on the table, right? That's our asset. We've got guaranteed walk away values, that's an asset. So this is what I really wanna do here at the end, just kind of paint the picture of what that spectrum looks like for a specific client. But let's go back to that Mutual of Omaha premium of $64.95, right? That's out of the gate. But as we all know, it's not going to stay that way, right? So our premiums for the standalone, $64.95, our asset base using the nationwide product was $15,970, and our John Hancock Protection UL with Ryder was $95.75. But let's look 10 years down the line. Now, there is a website out there, and there's a, a link in here that I, I'm pretty sure they'll send this to you, um, that is actually real, actually applied for and implemented rate increases with multiple insurance companies out there that offer standalone long-term care. So we just went from, found an average, right? So we're just gonna assume a three-year increase of 32% every three years. And unfortunately, that's very realistic. So 10 years down the line, that's 64.95. Now she's paying a premium of almost $15,000, right? So now you're almost where you were out of the gate with a stand or with the asset-based product with Nationwide. But with, again, the Nationwide product, we already have that death benefit in place and guaranteed cash surrender value. So this is why, you know, kind of looking downstream, those asset-based products, even though they seem more expensive out of the gate, they're actually ultimately gonna be a very affordable asset for your clients to put on the books to cover their care. All right, now I wanna show you a different type of scenario. So that was a single life case. Um, you know, we, we do have options though when we're working with couples that can be very, very powerful. And we're looking actually at a One America product here. They're actually the only one that can offer an actual second to die structure on the death benefit component of their product. So I just kind of want to show you what that would look like. So let's say it's our same female, 65, but now her husband is 67, now he actually could use a little protection too. So slightly different shift to our story for them. And they've accumulated some assets, let's say they're a million, million and a half plus, like they, you know, they're doing really well moving into retirement. So they're able to kind of put their finger on what I would call a dormant asset, right? That what assets do I have that if I were to get sick, you know, I'm not gonna use for income, I'm gonna use for long-term care. Those are the, the easiest assets to really work with and reposition here for one of these strategies. And they can do that. Uh, it's a non-qualified asset, uh, right around $200,000. So what could we do for them with that? Using that One America product called Asset Care, I'm able to take that 200,000 and leverage it into, again, minimal leverage for death benefit. That is by design. So we're gonna turn that into a $208,070 tax-free second to die death benefit. But for long-term care purposes, that equates to 6240 per month per person for up to both lifetimes, again, tax-free long-term care. So if maybe just husband's using this, right, he's going to get right around $75,000 a month out of this policy indefinitely. But let's say they both use it, right? They're both maxing out at the same time. It's rare, but it, it could be a possibility. Now we're talking about them getting around $150,000 tax-free a year out of this policy, and they only paid in two hundred. dollars And there's no end point, like I said, right? They could, they could both, you know, God forbid, have Alzheimer's or dementia and both need claims for eight, nine, 10, 11 years, it would cover them. So it's pretty powerful. But let me show you how that compares to other asset-based long-term care policies. So what you've got at top, that's our asset care that I just went through for you. Um, and what I've done is I put total benefits in here. Okay, so total premium 200,000, we have our death benefit at 208.70. I combined that 62.40 a month um, so we ultimately could get 12480 a month between the two of them out of the policy. 
Then what I did is I took that 200,000 and I split that up into two individual policies with the competition with 100,000 each. So I did two individual money guards, two individual care matters two, and two individual secure cares. And again, these are combined benefits between the two of them, each using the six year benefit period structure because that's kind of the sweet spot here. So again, our asset care is gonna provide an unlimited benefit up to 12,480 a month. The money guard um, kind of comes in second here. It does have a higher combined death benefit and sometimes that's important, right? And if it is, maybe the asset care isn't gonna make the most sense for us. But it's gonna come in second with a combined total LTC benefit of 12,080. Care Matters 2 kind of right in the middle Secure care is going to do uh, the least as far as leverage for long-term care. However, you know, to keep this all kind of, you know, fair and balanced, let's look at that return of premium. So maybe these clients are just very, very concerned that they get their money back if they were to change their mind, right? Secure is going to be a great option here for them because we have a 100% return of premium on this product. So kind of got to weigh it out here. So this is the power though that we have when we're looking to cover two people. We always want to make, <clears throat> excuse me, make sure that we're looking at that One America option and see if it's going to be a good fit for them and provide them the most value. All right, we're going to run through, this is probably going to be one of the quickest qualified money conversations um, I'll ever have. Um, and this, this is definitely something that we dig in on on a case-by-case -case basis if you've got somebody. But working with qualified money, I mean, I, it's all day, every day that we have this conversations. And there's obviously multiple ways you can do this. Um, you can go what I call old school, right? Leave it where it is, take your distributions, pay your taxes, use the net as premium, right? We do that all day long to fund life insurance. We see it all day long to fund asset-based long-term care as well. But again, I am going to highlight One America here, and it's only because, like I said in the beginning, they offer a lot of unique value. This is one of them. They have a product um, that is designed to accept a rollover of qualified money in a lump sum, and they're going to take over the distribution of the taxes on behalf of the client. So let me kind of show you how that works. First, I'm going to show you a quick little case study, and then I'm going to kind of flow chart that through and help you understand how it works. So again, we have our same couple, but now let's say that 200,000 that they have to work with isn't non-qualified, but it's sitting in a qualified IRA, okay? But they wanna work with us. Let's say it's the husband. We can still use this and cover both of them and accomplish that same thing that we did earlier. So the way that this works is they roll over the 200,000. We're gonna leverage that up into a death benefit. This one is just slightly under um, our premium amount. But the death benefit for this, 191,280. For long-term care, what this is gonna do for them is 5740 a month, but it's tax-free, 100% tax-free, again, per person for up to both lifetimes using the 200,000 qualified rollover. So again, just some quick numbers for you. 68,880, that's what we could get out of this policy tax-free if just one is using claim or up to 137,760 if again, they're both pulling max claim at the same time. Let me show you again. Oops, I just noticed I got, it threw me off for a second. My female is 65, she's not 63. So let me kind of flow chart this out for you and explain what we're doing. So the way that this product works is that $200,000 IRA gets rolled over into the asset care product. Within this particular solution, that product contains a qualified annuity. Now it's not a SPIA, and that's important, right? Because you lose a little bit of flexibility there. It's just a single premium annuity, but it has an income rider embedded that's gonna spit this money out over 10 years. So we roll it over into the IRA annuity. The IRA annuity spins down the qualified money over 10 years. Now there's a guaranteed growth rate in there as well, so what that's going to equate out to is 24,000 a year over 10 years. That 24,000 is used as premium to fund this policy. 
So it's kind of divvied up kind of behind the scenes that 24,000 is going to fund both a portion of its funding that life insurance of 191,280 and a portion of it's going to fund that unlimited long term care benefit pool. But all they did was move over 200,000 to do this. And again, that combination of both the acceleration of the life insurance as well as that unlimited pool is going to, that's what's equating to our 5740 per person. So kind of a, this visual kind of helps me kind of wrap my head around this new product. Jamie, that was our the, error when I, when, I, when I put the presentation together. It is an age 67 female, correct? Uh, she's In 65. this example, she's so 67, 67 male. 65. Yeah. Yep. Okay, yeah, because yep. it's got to be over 65. And the other, the other point, and this comes up a lot, is, you know, we can certainly use a, an annuity, a standalone annuity to, to fund these, but the reality of it is, I think the mechanics that that One America has created is what really is kind of the secret sauce here. Would you agree with that? No, absolutely. It's just kind of taking the simplicity. It's just, this is really about if all they did was create a mousetrap, if you want to think about it that way, right? We're still accomplishing the same thing that you could do on your own. We're just taking the onus off of the client and the advisor to make sure those premiums get taken, that the taxes get paid, that the premium gets over to the company. Again, could it be done? Absolutely. Um, and sometimes that makes more sense. But a lot of that has to do with where that qualified money is. Right? If your qualified money is sitting in an asset that's earning 6%, right, this might not make the most sense. Right? Why would we push that into an annuity that's only earning 3 Right? So again, this is just a, an example of how it works, whether or not it's the right thing. You know, that's, obviously, that's a discussion on a case-by-case -case basis. Jamie, just a quick follow-up question that popped up. Um, in that scenario, could we, in essence, run that same plan design if we had 100000 coming from qualified dollars from the husband and $100,000 coming from the, the spouse? Or did, would that require a, a second policy? It would require a second policy because the rollover obviously has to come over like for like. So in this exact scenario, and we, we actually have kind of two components in play. We've got a qualified annuity that is issued, and then that annuity is going to spit out. And since now they're considering that being taxed out money, now we're funding that second to die life insurance policy. So we can only have the, quali the current qualified money owner as the owner of the IRA annuity. So we can't commingle 100 from him and 100 from her into one qualified annuity. But we could do two so separate to, joint policies, right? Where they could we could coordinate the two policies. Absolutely. Right. And they'd be they'd be right, pretty much you. identical in that right that you're doing, except the annuity owner would be different in the two separate policies. But yeah, absolutely. And we actually see that quite a bit. Any other questions before I move on? No, that's good. Go ahead, keep keep moving. Thanks so much. All right, for we're making that. we're making we're making good time here, guys. Okay. Great. So again, here's what I wanted to show you as well. Okay. So a little bit of a, a little comparison here. So again, that top line is our asset care, right? That we just showed. So the 200 rollover, you've got your death benefit, you've got that unlimited pool with a total opportunity of getting 11,480 a month tax free for life. So what I did to compare, since I don't have another product that works just like this. Um, what I did is I just assumed we're going to just take manual distributions out of a $200,000 annuity, and I'm also assuming no taxes with help, just to try to keep it as apples to apples as I can. And let's say we split that distribution up, and we fund two individual policies with the competition. So I was able to use Care Matters 2 and Money Guard on this. I couldn't bring Secure Care to the table just due to age limitations on a 10 pay. So the Care Matters 2 um, is going to give, again, better combined death benefit. That's pretty normal from what we see. But the total combined LTC there, again, using that six-year benefit, is only 10515 And then Money Guard actually came in behind Care Matters on this one, um, just barely, right? But we do actually have better return of premium with the Money Guard. So again, what's more important to them, right? More per month for up to two lifetimes. Is it more important for them to have some death benefit to go to each other? Or is kind of walk away value more important? These are the things that we look at. But 
qualified money, moral of the story, absolutely can be used. Again, we could use the One America solution and kind of one and done it, or again, depending if maybe that asset is, is makes more sense to keep it where it is and try to work some positive arbitrage, we have options there as well. So that's, that's a very simple uh, qualified money type of conversation here. Now, before I move on to my second uh, or my third kind of, of asset conversation, I want to just pause and say one thing. All of these solutions that we have that I have at my disposal um, with MoneyGuard, SecureCare, and One America, all of that is great and dandy. But the biggest single competition to any of these products is not another product. It's cash, right? And I say that because when we're typically working with this demographic, like I said, most of these clients have accumulated enough assets heading into retirement that they have that luxury, if you will, of saying, you know, this $200,000, this $100,000, I'm not going to need it for income, right? I'll use it if I get sick, and if I don't, I'm going to pass it to my kid, right? That, what a blessing, right? They've worked really, really hard and, you know, good for them and great for their advisor. So this mindset, though, of these types of clients typically can lean towards the idea of self-funding. I'll just self-fund. I don't need to do this. Well, I always say these are actually the easiest clients to work with, um, twofold. One, they, you know, always the mantra that my grandma always said was just because you can doesn't mean you should. But they also appreciate the idea of leverage, of tax efficiency, um, of asset protection. So they're actually some of the easiest clients to work with, especially if you show them something like this. Now, this is just a, a quick little synopsis here. Let's say we have our 67-year-old male, and he's like, ah, you know, I can, I can totally self-fund. I have enough assets. Um, just to keep the numbers real simple, let's just say $100,000, right, that he has, um, that he'd be looking to do some sort of a self-funding strategy with. And let's say he's got a 33% tax bracket. This is super powerful. That $100,000 into an asset-based long-term care product, and it just happens to be the money guard product for this example, by the time he's age 80, because we're going to use some inflation here, we could turn that $100,000 into $435,085. Okay? Let's say we had an asset that was earning 4%. That after-tax value at age 80, 141.30. Let's say the asset was earning 6%. After-tax value at age 80, 166.925. I think that this is a super powerful tool and presentation to use, and we can kind of show you guys where to find this um, to help you kind of really put in perspective the power that asset-based long-term care puts in place when we're talking about repositioning and leveraging their dollars that they would typically use to fund a long-term care event anyways. Hey, Jamie, on that example, the 435, kind of what is, what is that value driven off? Is that a cash value accumulation using the reserve product, or is this really looking at the value of the LTT benefits? Can you just explain kind of high this level the, what that, this is, what this that is value is? Yeah, this is the pool for LTC. So his hundred thousand would turn into a total LTC pool of four thirty five eighty five. It has nothing to do with cash. But there's still a but there's still a surrender and a return of premium that is going to oh, give him a good majority of the money back if he never uses it. So we're still in a scenario where we're getting back most of what we put in if we don't need the LTC coverage. Yep, and in this exact example, again, and I could send you the illustration that supports it, it'd be 80,000 level, like a return of premium value because I'm looking at the money guard product. Um, so a walk away would be 80 grand. But if we're talking about self-funding and leveraging for long-term care, do we want this 100,000 to turn into 435 tax-free? Or do we want to look at these net after-tax values at a, you know other assets? I, I think that's really the power of this conversation. Agreed. No, that's very compelling. All right. So, again, one of the other kind of common questions that I get is, you know, who – can I help me define who's the ideal client? Who should I be talking to? And I, I would say probably five – even five years ago, this was a very cut-and-dry conversation. It was the couples that we just looked at, right? It was 65-plus, 
you know, maybe 60. And the reason why is we were primarily looking at single pays to very short pays, maybe five years, maxing out at 10 years. So these are those clients that had to have already accumulated the assets to where they could put that finger on one that they could use. It's hard to do that, right, when you're under age 60 unless you're, you know, very, very, you know, affluent already. So it was typically your affluent, mass affluent, retiree type of marketplace. That story has shifted tremendously in the past five years, especially even in the last 12 months, um, which I actually think is extremely exciting. So now your ideal client is you know, all across the board, but I put some thought into this and I kind of broke it into four quadrants. So the top left quadrant in green, again, that's where we've been for a long, long time. Cash strong clients, 60 plus, right? They can contribute anywhere from 50K up to 500,000 of some you know, cash to throw at this, anywhere from a single pay to a 10 pay, right? That's where we've been for, for most of the time in this market. Uh, bottom left in blue, now these kind of the same conversation, but these are those people that are looking to work with their qualified money in some way. So again, IRAs, RMDs, qualified annuities, but we're still looking at those clients that can contribute those bigger premium dollars and a single premium, possibly, you know, doing some flexible premiums, but generally five years to a 10 year premium duration. But it's our quadrants on the right that we're really seeing expansion of this market. So upper right quadrant, right, our, our guys in orange here. These are our pre-retirees. So we're about maybe 10 years heading into retirement. Um, so they're, they're still working. They're still accumulating. But a lot of times, you know, the acronym, the Henrys, right, are high earners, not yet retired. These are those sorts of individuals. Um, maybe they get really strong annual bonuses that they can throw at this, or they just have a really strong income and they can contribute anywhere from 5,000 a year up to 50,000 a year in annual premiums, right? But we're still typically looking at a five pay to a 10 pay for these. They wanna get them paid up before they head into retirement. So seeing a lot more people in their mid fifties, probably in the last several years than we saw maybe eight years ago. I've been in this market a long time. But what really gets me super excited is those young professionals or even middle market. Okay, so these are clients typically as young as 40 to 45 years old, maybe up to age 50. Never ever would have looked at this particular demographic for this market before now. Um, so these are those people, obviously they're still working, um, they got you know, strong incomes, but they have not, they don't have those single premiums to move. Um, but they can contribute maybe anywhere from 5,000, you know, maybe still up to 50,000 in annual premiums. But these are premium durations that are stretched out for their entire lifetime. And we're starting to see, you know, One America's had this for a while, like a pay to age 95. Well, Nationwide just joined this market on a pay to age 100. Um, maybe they receive an annual bonus they can throw at this, but Again, minimum 10 pay, but more often I'm seeing them stretch these out kind of for on a whole life chassis uh, premium. Let me, I don't have this case study in here, but I just worked on a case for a 53 year old male and he was paying $500 a month, 500 a month. And by the time he was 85, his tax-free long-term care pool was $1.3 million. So I think we did the math and by age 80, he was gonna have paid around 150,000 in total premiums to leverage $1.3 million of tax-free long-term care. And the reason why this really resonated for him is again, he'll never see a premium increase for his entire life, locked in at a healthy 53-year-old rate. He's got death benefit on the books if something happened. And again, he's got cash surrender value growing as well. Super, super powerful opportunity that I just don't want to be ignored. So I'm gonna get off my soapbox on that. <laughs> you can tell I get a little bit excited about the expansion of this market. That's what it's all about. I'm gonna cover my You're last passionate. We love that. asset. I know, I just I just love it. Maybe because it's my demographic, right? You know, as a 45 year old, yeah, I'm like, this is awesome. Like, I, I just think, why not? You know, let's, let's bring it to the masses. Um, so what I'm gonna close with here, despite is maybe as excited as I sound about all these other ideas, 
this I truly believe is the most underutilized biggest opportunity we have in the asset-based long-term care market. And that's going after those non-qualified annuities. And the reason I say it's so underserved is just the, the size of the opportunity that's out there. So you'll see this number 73%. So of the trillions of dollars of annuities that are purchased every year, right, for guaranteed income, which by the way, fantastic. I sold my parents an Aviva multi-choice annuity way back in the day, and they're going to use theirs for income. That's what they're sold for. But this number blew me away. This was a Gallup poll that was done, I want to say now, gosh, it's been four years ago, 2015. But they surveyed annuity owners and they asked them, what are you going to do with this annuity? And 73% said, I'm, they did not say I'm going to use it for the guaranteed income for which I purchased it for, but rather it's their emergency fund in case they get sick, right? They said, this is the asset I'm going to use in case of a catastrophic illness or I need to go to like any sort of nursing home facility. 73% trillions of dollars of annuities sold every single year. Now, of course, those are, you know, qualified, non-qualified, indexed, fixed, variable, uh, where we really want to focus on here, though, is our non-qualified annuities. That's really where we have this great opportunity. And that opportunity is all thanks to what we call the Pension Protection Act. And again, this could be a, you know, a good 20-minute deep dive. I'm going to just explain Pension Protection Act, or PPA, in about 60 seconds. So here's what the Pension Protection Act does. What it's going to do is allow a non-qualified annuity owner to do a tax-free 1035 exchange into an annuity-based product. We've got a couple of them that we work with. Obviously, that happens tax-free, right? Now we're going to let them get all of those long-term care benefits out tax-free as well. So let me just do a quick little diagram. So let's say we've got an annuity, started it with 100,000. Um, maybe it's been an index product that's done really well over the last 10 plus years. Now let's say it's worth $250,000. Now, this is their rainy day fund. This is what they're going to use. If they were to tap into that current annuity for any sort of a long-term care expense, right, they're going to be taxed on those gains, right? They're taxed on a LIFO treatment. So the alternative with the Pension Protection Act is to 1035 that entire annuity, including all of those gains, into a qualified PPA annuity. What do I mean by qualified? Again, I'm going to give you the really high-level definition of that. It's got to be compliant with the 7702B tax code, right? It is a long-term care product. It just happens to be built on an annuity chassis, right? That's your super high-level definition of that. So we do that tax-free. But now when we use our new annuity for long-term care expenses, 100% tax-free. So in essence, what we've done here for in this example is we're giving these annuity holders the ability to not pay taxes on all of those deferred gains for a long-term care expense, which they're planning to use it for anyway. Super, super powerful opportunity that we have. So let me kind of show you what this looks like. So now let's say we've got a 70-year-old male and he's got that 200,000 annuity, okay? This, let's just say this was his. Started with 100, thousand and and now it's worth 200 okay so a hundred thousand dollars worth of gains in here we're going to 1035 that in to a total pool of six hundred and five thousand seven hundred and thirty dollars of tax-free long-term care so that's eighty four ten a month that they could be getting out of this tax-free or possibly 100920 a year. Let's say, you know, he's maxing that out every year for the entire duration. So how does that actually compute into what I call annuity speak? I was an annuity marketer back in the day. And it's all about, well, what's my income payout factor, right? What, what do I get out of this per month? So if we left that annuity where it was at $200,000, it would have to pay out 50,000 or 50,000, 50.5% 50 in order to generate 100,920 a year. And by the way, that's gotta be right after tax. That annuity does not exist, right? 
In fact, I think a pretty competitive income payout factor for a 70 year old right now in the market, say like, I think this is with F and G is about six and a half percent. So again, what do they want out of their non-qualified annuity that they're going to use for long-term care anyway? So they want to get 50.5% out tax-free. And by the way, that would last about six years. I'm using the four care product here with Global Atlantic. Or do we want to get them six and a half percent and pay taxes on a LIFO basis? I think the answer is pretty obvious. We do have some other really compelling options with One America as well. But I thought I'd show for care a little bit of love here just because it kind of looks like a money or a one America story the whole time. So ideal client on this is a little bit different. Okay. We definitely need these people to be at or near retirement. That only makes sense because that's typically the annuity market. Anyways, um, we need that annuity to obviously to be non-qualified, but we definitely want this one to be what I call dormant. We need to be very confident that this annuity is not going to be needed uh, maybe for that income writer that they bought it for, okay? Because once we move it over, you could annuitize it, but it's not very attractive. It's not what it's designed to do. So let's just got to make sure. Um, surrender charge is important. Now, I've never seen ever like, a suitability type of issue by 1035 exchanging over something that had a surrender charge. However, it takes some of the zing out of it, right? So if, if if we have a big chunk of surrender charges coming out, that kind of negates this tax play that we're working here. So I would say at least, you know, at a minimum three years to be out of surrender charge, if not completely out. It needs to have a significant amount of deferred gain. Now, significant can mean different things for different people. And the reason why this is important is this is a tax play, right? If that 200,000 annuity was started with 150,000, now we have a different conversation, right? Now maybe we spend it down, pay some minimal taxes, and we purchase a life-based product because we're just always going to get a little bit better leverage on a life-based product than we are an annuity-based product. So this is definitely a tax conversation. So, you know, whatever significant, and I used my air quotes here that you can't see, um, means to that client that we want to, you know, make sure that that's in play. And then we this will not work with those two tiered annuities, uh, not picking on Allianz by any means, but they're probably the most prominent, you know, old seller of those, like those master Dex products, right? These are those products that had forced annuitization, right? Um, in order to keep your premium bonus and in order to keep all of your deferred gains, you have to, you know, annuitize that product over, you know, X amount of years. If you were to try to walk away from those, you lose your premium bonus and you only get the guaranteed minimum account value. So that's 87 and a half percent at the rate between two and three, that obviously is not going to work here. Um, we actually have a strategy that we use for those, um, but that's a whole nother discussion. So these are those clients. Um, and I also just kind of want to point out for anybody on the line of the typically I'll also hear, well, I don't sell annuities. So this isn't for me. It absolutely is for you. You don't have to sell annuities, right? You didn't have to sell them this annuity, but somebody did at some point, right? You're not selling annuities. You're talking about asset-based long-term care. We just happen to switch the asset that it's based on to be appropriate for this solution to work. It's also one of the easiest ones to implement, right? You don't have to spend a single dollar of marketing or anything for this, right? It can be done at client intake, you get a new client. It can be done during any sort of client review that you have. You simply need to look at the assets on the book. What are they bringing to you? If you see a non-qualified annuity in there that kind of fits those parameters, you ask one question. One, are you still planning to use this annuity for income? If they say yes, Move on from this, right? Does not apply. Maybe you still have another opportunity to get them into a better, more current annuity. That's a whole other conversation. But this isn't going to make sense. But if they give you any indication that they're one of the 73% that says, eh, I'll probably use it in case I get sick, but if I don't, I'll pass it to my kids. Now you've got a conversation. Would you like to show you that a way to maybe, you know, avoid paying taxes on these gains for long-term care? they're going to say, well, yeah, show me that, right? So it's super, super easy conversation, tons of opportunity. Um, again, I think one of the most underutilized 
um, assets to fund long-term care that we have. And that's it. I covered a lot in 45 minutes. So, Court, do we have any other questions that have been thrown in there? I think that's a record, Jamie. I just want to say that I am going to submit this to the Guinness Book of World Records for the absolute <laughs> quickest review of asset-based long-term care. Um, no, I think you did, did a fabulous job. And I think, you know, the main takeaway here is that there is so much more flexibility and customization than there was, you know, even five or ten years ago where the options were just so much more limited. And I think that, you know, we're seeing a lot of activity. Obviously, the changes to the new CSO tables is something that we're all going to be grappling with as we get more and more in here. But I think that the options that are available and leveraging these qualified dollars and leveraging annuities and opening up these additional conversations is, is exceptionally invaluable. Um, and, you know, it doesn't seem like I've got any other specific questions right now. We'll obviously be following up subsequent to this, and we'll have a copy of the recording and the presentation for anybody that wants it. Uh, but most importantly, I want you guys to know that we, we have access to Jamie when we have cases that we need. Um, One America has a great advanced team. They all, the, all the carriers have provided some real high-level support. Um, Justin and Eric and, uh, over at the Fortify Case Design team have, have really developed some expertise in here. Um, so, you know, if you have any opportunities and want to talk about any of those four quadrants, because there are so many different ways to target now than there were, you know, again, back five or ten years ago when we were more limited on where these things and who who is going to be eligible for these types of policies. Um, so, Jamie, I just want to thank you again for taking the time. I know we'll be speaking with you again, uh, you know, later in the year as we dig into some more detailed conversations about how to leverage these. Um, but I wanted to, again, you know, thank you so much for your time, and, and thanks to everybody who attended today. It was my pleasure. Thanks, everybody.